John chapter 11. I'll begin by reading that whole chapter. John 11. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha the sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? 
Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways into the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but, being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. John chapter 11, a very famous chapter. It reveals at the end of it, and I won't talk too much about it, but this was the tipping point for the Pharisees and, and really just affirming that their plan was going to be to kill Jesus, was going to be to destroy him in order that they could spare their little nation and their tiny control that they had been allotted over this space given by their Roman overlords. The Roman government had owned most of that land but had given a small amount of authority to the Jews to oversee their religious duties and, and those types of things. And they thought that their whole nation would be destroyed if Jesus was continued to allow to go and do miracles and heal people and bring even people from the dead that we've now just seen. Certainly all would believe there would be a riot as a result. Jesus, Jesus came as the Prince of Peace though. They were obviously mistaken, but nevertheless, they, they thought it expedient at this point on, from this point on, to try to put him to death. If we go back to verse 1, we'll just deal with the story of Lazarus and his resurrection. Now, this is a certain Lazarus. You can look at chapter 1. A certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 3 says, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest, is sick. So this is the sp a specific, a certain man of Lazarus, known in Bethany, who had fallen sick. The one whom Jesus loved is being brought before Jesus, sent as a message that he should come quickly. Mary and Martha set the message. You can read of them in verse 2. It says, It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Just one chapter over, as the book of John often does, it'll, it'll give in parentheses a story that's about to take place. Chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany was, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they met him a supper, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of sparknard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And we know that story continues on. Judas and the other disciples rise up and say, Why was this not sold and all that money given to the poor? The offering that Mary gave from her heart for Jesus 
was one of great cost. When we're giving to Jesus, we ought to count the cost and be willing to lose. We ought to be willing to give up. We ought to be willing to sacrifice, despite what the religious zealots around us say. And that's exactly what happened. The disciples looked to Mary and say, why, Jesus, would you allow her to do such a thing, to waste this? Jesus eventually said, let her alone, for she had done this to prepare me for my burying. Essentially, she in her own way, as a lady, prophesied of the burial that was about to come. Some sort of spiritual insight was given to her of the direction that Christ was headed in. And so she anointed his body for the burying aforehand and did so with a great sum that she had willingly offered of herself, of her own free will. Verse 3, back in chapter 11, says, Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So it says clearly that the sisters sent unto Jesus. Now, was this by the hand of a messenger? I believe so. Generally, they wouldn't just, you know, like our days, just send a text message or leave a voicemail, instant message them, you know, on Facebook. No, of course, she sent a message by the messenger, Somebody would go and would take the written message and, and would deliver that to Jesus. Verse 4 records then, if that's, if that's the presumption that it, I believe is true, verse 4 records the response of Jesus. It says, when Jesus heard that, what? That Lazarus was sick, the one whom he loved. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. The response then from Jesus was that this sickness, this ailment, this illness, this disease is not unto death. I think they missed that. But what also is important about this is that phrase at the end, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now look at verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It's not just Lazarus that was loved. It's Mary and Martha. And it's not just Lazarus, Mary and Martha that's loved. It's everyone in this room. It's at a time the whole world that Christ loved and gave himself for. But nevertheless, here the response is that this sickness is not unto death, but is there for the glory of God that Christ could be glorified. Now I believe this was sent in response by that same messenger, perhaps, they come and they say, Lazarus is sick, you love him, come. And Jesus returns and says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Now, if so, there definitely would have been a time that would happen. You know, I think sometimes we complain when our text message doesn't go instantaneously, it takes a few seconds, right? Back then, they would have had to march and tread and walk and, and traverse great distances in order to get that message across. So perhaps by the time Jesus' response came, what they heard from Jesus' response, this sickness is not unto death, might have been completely opposite to what they have seen. Perhaps by that time the message comes from Christ, this isn't unto death. Maybe he was already dead at that time. The Bible records that it was four days spanned from his death to the time Jesus arrived. Maybe he was already dead. Or maybe he was so sick and they'd seen it before, these cases, and they, they just could not believe that this wouldn't be unto death. He had but an inch of his life left, perhaps. What I believe was seen, though, before them, and the word which came, didn't resemble one another. The promise of Christ that this is not unto death, and the state of their brother at that time, I believe it was very different. Now the promise comes in scriptures and we sing about it. In Romans it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. O be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, cause thee to stand, upheld by thy gracious omnipotent hand. I somewhat quoted the scriptures and somewhat that favorite hymn. But the statement is made, Fear not, for I am with thee. And yet these say, Jesus come. He has not come yet. But a message, a word from him comes. And it says... This is not unto death. And they probably had a hard time believing that. Even as we, when we're at our lowest points, when Jesus says, I am with thee, probably have a hard time believing that. Where is God? 
Where is he in my suffering, in my sickness, in my worrying, in my struggle? Where is the Lord? And yet we have a message from him that says, fear not, I am with thee. Sometimes, though, our reality and the word of God are, are different, isn't it? Verse 5 records that Jesus loved. Jesus loved. Verse 6, it continues and says, And when he had heard, therefore, and that statement, Jesus loved, is another one that we need to remember and accept by faith and not, not worry that that's not true. Well, why does God love me? He's not here. He doesn't love me. Just take that and, and own that. Jesus loves you this day. He loved you so much he gave his son. He loves you even still now. Verse 6, And when he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in that same place where he was. Now Jesus seems confident. Jesus seems sure enough that he's not going to rush off and race to the aid of Lazarus. Therefore, when he had heard, therefore, what's before there? Again, we're asking that question today. What's that therefore, therefore? But for the glory of God. And because Jesus loved them, he abode two days. I believe that's what that's pointing to. When he had heard the bad news, therefore that he was sick, he abode two more days. Because God loved them, because God wanted to get glory in his son. He abode yet two more days. Why did he delay? We would think that if he loved them so much and wanted to be glorified, he would rush off to their aid. But nevertheless, for those same reasons, because he wanted glory and because he loved them so, he abode still and did not rush to their aid. Why does God delay in our lives when we're waiting for something to be fulfilled, a promise that he made, when we've been praying and praying earnestly that God would lift a burden from our shoulders and he just lingers. Why is he doing that? Why is he delaying his coming? I believe the same reasons. Because he loves us and for his own glory. He lets us wait. You can continue on in verse 7. It says, Then after that saith he unto his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. Okay, so he waited two days, then finally arises and says to the disciples, We're off to Judea. His disciples, verse 8, say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? They remind him, hey, you're going to face danger. You've got enemies there, and you're going to prepare to return into this place? I think the disciples were content to sit idly by. I don't think it was because they had faith that Lazarus' sickness was not unto death, or maybe they just believed that at face value, but also because they didn't want to face the danger that was waiting for them back in Jerusalem. And so they made the statement, why are we going back to Judea? They'll stone thee there, Lord. I think that it was another example of their doubt, and throughout this you're going to see Jesus' command or, and promise, rather, Jesus' promise and the reality end up being two very different things for a while. And there's a time in between where men have to exercise faith. And we're going to see that same thing play out here before the disciples. Certainly Mary and Martha received the message. It's not unto death. And maybe he had already died. And so they're like, how could he say that when it's not true? And they're doubting and they're worrying. And now the disciples... They say, hey, we don't need to go back there for fear of the Jews that of late have sought to stone Jesus. The answer of Jesus is incredibly deep, and I don't think I've even scratched the surface of what this might mean. But verse 9 records, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. I think quite often we see the danger instead of the Savior. We see the problem instead of the promise. We rely on the light of the world instead of relying on the light of life, which is Jesus Christ. Look, there's 12 hours in the day. 
So at least the disciples should have enough faith to walk when they can see, to walk when the light of the world is there to embolden them, to walk when they don't have to worry about tripping and stumbling, when everything is clear. Certainly 12 hours in the day you can give me faith, but look about the nighttime. A man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. And our light in us ought to be the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ, so that we can even walk in the day as in the night, and we can walk confidently because we have faith in the Savior. If we rely too much on the light of this world, we are half as effective and twice as afraid when the night comes. Think about when things are so certain in your life, you can walk confidently. There's compartments of your life, I bet you, you really got things together. You've really got a, a grasp on it. Maybe it's your workplace, maybe it's, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your home. You've, you've got things together, it's all in control. But then there's parts of your life that are a little bit dark, a little bit, um, there's anxieties there and fears. There's uncertainties in those compartments of your life. And if we're relying on the light of the world, on what's stable and secure in this world, we're only half as effective. All of us can be effective where we're comfortable and we can see clearly, but not all of us can be effective and comfortable in the place where we don't see clearly, where it's dark, where we are in danger of stumbling. And it's in those times when we really just need to give it to God and have faith in Him. When He promises it's not unto death, that's a dark time in someone's life. We need to just accept, God said it, I believe it, and walk in that truth. And when you walk in that light, you'll see. Because you'll have that light in you. You'll stop relying on the light of this world and the clarity of this life. And you'll start to be able to follow the light of the world of the word, and that word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Verse 11 records, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Are they still trying to talk him out of going there for fear? Or are they just rationally thinking, hey, if, if he's sleeping, if he's resting, you've already said that it's not unto death, maybe he will do well, maybe he will grow better, okay? Their, words, their world is about to get rocked, howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. And remember, these are believing, perhaps, that word that he had said is not unto the death. And then Jesus saith unto them plainly, in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And their world's rocked. And they've just went from light into darkness. So much so that in verse 16, then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Just, just floored. The promise of God is not fulfilled. What is happening here? But Jesus says there's a purpose here in verse 15. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Look, it's for their own good that Jesus was not there at that time. To the intent that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. So here the Lord is giving a certain promise that they're going to arrive unto him and to his place. Certainly they had received the plain statement that Lazarus is dead. And you know what? Sometimes when God just gives us plain words, it floors us just like this, doesn't it? Sometimes we can read Psalms and they're kind of cryptic or poetic and, and we can embrace them. And, and, and Jesus can say, you know, he, he is asleep, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. And, and that sounds poetic and that sounds good. But then plainly when Christ comes to us and says, Lazarus is dead, we're just sunk, floored, the, the wind gone out of our sails. And then Jesus says, I'm glad. Why are you glad, Lord? Why is he glad? Because he loves us. Because he's doing it for his glory. And because he wants us to believe. Troubles and sorrows in our lives, uncertainties, fears, loss, come so that we might believe. So that we might grow in faith. So that we might get stronger in our faith. God loves us, and for his glory, he, he does things. He delays 
rushing to our aid. Why? Because it's got to get to the point where we just think that there's no hope. There's nothing we can do to overcome. There's no chance of survival. There's no hope for another day. I'm lost. There's nothing that could ever happen to turn this situation around. And that's when Christ steps in, shows his love, and for his own glory does something so great that empowers our faith for the next struggle and next trial that's ahead. We continue on after passing over Thomas or Didymus. In verse 17, it says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. That's about three kilometers. You could walk that in a half an hour maybe. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now four days in the grave. Now the comforting and mourning continues, which probably started about, you know, day three and a half previous as, as the message gets forth and starts being passed around. You know, it wasn't like social media again where they just sent out a tweet and everybody knew. But people had to learn by word. But nevertheless, many had come. Bethany was nigh, and here many of the Jews come to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And because many showed up, we see that they were well-loved, not only of Jesus, but of the people there in Jerusalem. So they came to comfort them and spent much time with them to that end. Verse 20 continues, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And Jesus had just previously said to the disciples, I was glad that I was not there. Is he saying he's glad that he died? No, but again, he's looking for something better for them. Not just the healing of a sick brother, but he wants the glory of God and his love to be shown unto them. Verse 22 says, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now look at this. Martha makes the statement in verse 21, I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus responds, bonds with the promise that thy brother shall rise again and Martha's reaction is I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day at first she stepped out in faith and said even now I can have what I want and now she's saying I know that it will come one day afar off she's going before Jesus with a sense of unbelief of what he's even able to do she knows that he's given sight to the blind. She knows that he's given hearing to the deaf. She knows that he's healed sicknesses, and to that end, she probably reached out to him and sent the messenger. But what's about to happen, she had never seen, and so she doesn't have any, anything of this world to compare it to. And so she says, yes, 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 Lord. I know you can have whatever you want even now, but I know that I can't. I know that whatever, Jesus, you ask of the Father, God will give it to you even now. But that's just not for me. I look for my brother to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. We need to get to the point where we stop believing in the God that fulfills promises in the last day and start believing in the God that will fulfill his promises even now. Okay, I think too often we're a little bit like Martha and we doubt and we waver and he that wavereth is as the waves of the sea and does not receive of the promise. You need to pray in faith, nothing, no doubting, no wavering. And Martha here wavers and says, yes, Lord, you can have whatever you want, but that's not for me. I'll wait. I know I have to wait for that promise which is to come. Believe God even now. The Bible records I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And that's not just in the time to come when we have glorified bodies and we're in heaven and we're perfect, right? That is today. That is right now that you can do all things through Christ 
which strengtheneth you. Think about that promises that's made, that's, that's a mustard grain of seed, a, a grain of mustard seed of faith can move a mountain. And we say, yeah, 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 Lord, we know that in the last day the mountains will fall and, and all of these things will take place. We need to get to the point where we stop believing in the last days and start believing even now for God to move mountains in our lives. Mountains of, of sicknesses, mountains of cares and worries and struggles, mountains of, of, of pain, the, the different things, the biggest thing that's going on in your life, the biggest worry in your care, that mountain in your life is not to be filled in a day to come that should be fulfilled right now, and you got to believe that it can be fulfilled right now. Jesus is going to show something to Martha. She makes the statement, Lord, if you were here, my brother would not have died, and yet she doesn't believe that he can do anything for her today. Rather, that time has come, and she'll look forward to a time way down in the future where things can be fulfilled and, and resolved. Look, she thought she missed her chance, and now she's thinking that the next chance is a long way off. She's doubting God will use the here and now and use her in the here and now to what? Get glorified and to show his love. That's just not true. Verse 25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. She believes in who he is. She's having a lot of trouble believing in what he does. And we get that way, don't we? We can open the book. We can believe in Jesus as the King of kings, Lord of lords, the Savior of my soul. But we fall short of believing in the things he does and can do and will do and wants to do in our lives today. Martha's the same way. She believes in who he is. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I believe who you are, Jesus the Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I believe who you are. I believe in you. But your promises aren't for me. Your promises are far off. I'll see them one day, and I'm thankful for that. No, 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 no. Even now, as Christ can ask the Father, you can ask Jesus as the intercessor and receive those same promises. We get this way when what we see in this world is not the same as what was promised. When God promises you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you, and you come to a roadblock of something that you can't accomplish, you're like, well, those promises, yeah, they're, they're far off. Or maybe I missed it. It's not even now. It's not today. No, it is today. We've got to stop believing what we see and start believing what was promised and, and making that where we live each day in faith. Verse 28 continues, And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Verse 32, And when Mary was come, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. They both had the same realization. I don't know if they you know, talked it out together, but they both thought that if Christ was there with them, as he says, fear not, I am with thee. If you were here, my brother had not died. Again, remember, Jesus promised that he died for the glory of God. He died so that he could show his love. When Jesus, therefore, verse 33, saw her weeping, when Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? 
They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Now look at the difference in Jesus' response. The same statements were made by Martha and Mary. To Martha, he responded with the word. To Mary, he responded with weeping. You know what? God's got a different way of dealing with each and every one of us. We come to him probably with the same questions sometimes. We all pray for health. We all pray for fruitfulness in the ministry. We all pray for overcoming our sins. We all pray for our loved ones to get saved. We all come to him with the same issues. Here they came and said, Jesus, you weren't there. We need you to be here. Okay? But Jesus had a specific way of responding to both of them. And he'll do the same for us. He, he's got a particular relationship reserved for each and every one of us today. Verse 36. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. They had to behold how he loved them. God so loved the world. His love isn't just reserved for this Lazarus that had died. His love was showed to Martha when he tried to encourage her with the scriptures and with the word of God and, and remind her that, that, yes, there will be a resurrection. That resurrection is me. And look, I am here now. So when I say he will rise again, I'm telling you that when you look to the resurrection that is to come and I say that that's me, that I'm just showing you that, hey, the resurrection has arrived. That's me. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And he gives her this doctrinal explanation she misses it, okay, but she's in a time of turmoil, of course. Nevertheless, God is here, right? That he would glorify God and that he would show his love to each of them particularly. Verse 37, it says, And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus is coming to all sorts of roadblocks in his journey back here, isn't he? The threat of danger certainly by being stoned. Now he comes to Mary who's having trouble understanding that even now she can have her prayers answered and be, be, and be witness to the miracle of the glory of God and, and see God's love. Mary is in turmoil of heart, weeping and, and, and wailing as, as she loses her loved brother. Jesus groaned in his spirit and was troubled at the sight of her weeping. He weeps. And then the scoffers come. Could not this man, which did all these other miracles, have caused that this sickness could be healed? And Jesus groans further in verse 38. In himself, as he arrives at the grave and finds a stone there laid on, The major thing missing in all of these passages is faith in God. Belief in his provision. Belief in his miracles. Belief in that promise he made way back in verse 4. That this sickness is not unto death. There's a scene of great doubt before him. Jesus groans for the sake of those that are in doubt. And yet he also weeps in solidarity with those who are having trouble mustering up some faith. Okay? He's... He, he's, he, he's groaning and saying, why won't they see? Why won't they believe? But also weeping with them as they struggle to. Jesus knows our frame. Jesus knows we're weak as grass of the field, which fadeth and falleth away. Sometimes we have every reason to doubt. Sometimes there's great sickness which looks unto death. Sometimes there's, there's, there's disease. Here they saw that he was four days in the grave. Certainly he stinketh by now, the statement will be made. The morning is well underway. We've, we've been mourning these many days. Now you've arrived. We're glad you came, but couldn't you have come that first day and caused that this morning never took place? The truth of the matter is, is that this man, this Jesus that gave sight to the blind can cause that this one be made alive. The reason why he delayed is because he didn't want to show up and just do another miracle. 
where he stopped somebody from dying. No, he showed up in order that he could prove, verse 25, that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He wanted to prove himself that the Son of God might be glorified and God would receive glory and that his love would be manifested. And that's what he does in all points in this scripture. He's coming to, as he made the blind to see, make this one who is dead to be alive. Verse 39, it says, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. And so just one more reminder of the, of the doubt. Is there room for one more reason to doubt what God promised? Here Martha offers one. Verse 40. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? And that's why I believe that, yeah, that message went back. Verse 4 says, Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick and said, The sickness is not unto death. And here, Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? He's saying, Remember what the messenger said? Remember what the man carrying my word said unto you? If you would believe... You'll see God get glory. This is not unto death. Why? Because I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in a resurrection to come, and he has come. He that believeth shall never die. You know your brother believed. And yet when death is before you, it's hard to believe in someone never dying. When we see loved ones who were saved in a casket about to be put in the ground, it's hard for us to believe that they shall never die. But isn't that the truth of the scripture? He that believeth shall never die. It's this instantaneous thing that, yeah, absent from the body is present with the Lord. To us, we look at the body and we say, brother, so-and-so is dead. Right? But the truth of the scripture is they shall never die. God somehow in that moment when they're about to perish takes them away. It never happens. And yet to us on this earth, we're, we're doubting, we're worried, we're concerned. God's promise didn't come to pass because he said it's not unto death. He said that he will never die and he has died. Hey, God delayed so that he would die. Why? Because there must be a death before there's a resurrection. Someone has to die before they can be raised to life. Even if that death is only from the perspective of onlookers. Lazarus had never experienced it. Because the promise was made in verse 25. The problems in our life that cause us to doubt are necessary to cause us to believe. So what we need to understand is that, is that the more we face problems that, that floor us, that put us in darkness, that make us doubt everything that's going on in this life, and worry and have concern and fret and fear. Those problems that cause us to doubt are necessary to the end that we would believe. They cause us to believe. So we ought to pray as Christ does. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Jesus here prays believing that God has already heard him. He hasn't even made the statement. He hasn't even opened his mouth. I pray, pray God, thanking you that you have heard me. Verse 42, in the beginning it says, And I knew that thou hearest me always. He's trusting that God already knows and understands his needs. We need to pray in the same way. Believe God has already heard you and knows and understands what you need, even as you ask it. Verse 42 in the second part, it says, But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So when we pray, we ought to already know that God has heard us and already knows what we need. Sometimes it helps, and Jesus did the same thing, to make sure that other people hear your prayers and hear you pray so that they also can believe. We need to get to a point in our prayer life where we know that when we ask, we receive. And whatsoever we receive, we receive because without faith, without faith or without doubting, without fear, we ask in faith, and God promises that whosoever does so will receive whatsoever they ask, if they're not doubting. 
And yet even still, that's why we have prayer meeting. That's why we, we pray one with another. We do that on Thursdays. That's why we, we go to people with prayer requests. That's why I've been telling people that I'm just, I'm just waiting for God to give us a brand new vehicle. Okay, I know that God has that prayer answered somewhere down the line. I don't have it right now. I don't see it. But I'm trying my best to tell people, not because I'm soliciting somebody to buy me a vehicle. And if anybody wants to, I'm, I'm all ears. No, I'm not soliciting. I'm trying to get to the point that Jesus has where I know that God's going to provide. I know that he already has provided, knows what I need. I want everybody else to believe when it comes to pass. I want them to see and to go, wow, that's amazing how God worked that out. You don't have to, but I'm going to go to Matthew. Keep my finger in John. Matthew 21. And I'm going to try to wrap this up. Matthew 21 and verse 21. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, all things, all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. But what if we believe not? We have a God so good that says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And so God goes before us with groanings and utterings which we don't even know to think of. That's the ministry of the Spirit of God put in us. And I'm thankful for that. But the promise still remains that whatsoever ye ask, believing ye shall receive. If you don't doubt, if you don't waver, if you trust God to provide what you are asking for. Step boldly before his grace, before his throne of grace. Romans 8 and verse 22. Romans 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body, right? There's a promise made that our body will be redeemed. That's long away. That's far, far, far in history. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? If you see your provision, hey, you're not going to hope for it and pray after it. Verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart and knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God, and we know, and this is one thing you need to know as you walk this life, you have the Spirit of God already interceding for you, already praying for groanings which cannot be uttered, things that you haven't even thought of that are on your horizon. God is already, according to His will, lining up for you as a saint. We know that all things that are from here to the fulfillment, for Martha and Mary, all things that were from the invite for Christ to come, the message sent unto him arriving and raising their brother from the dead. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And believer, you are the called according to his purpose. And so in your life, while you are in darkness, in between the call to God to help you with this situation and the response that he makes in the affirmative, all those things in the middle, the hills and the valleys, are working together for good for you. And you can count on that. You can bank on that. You can believe that. We are looking for glory that's to come. And sometimes we get too confused and we look off into the last day and we forget that today is the day. Why? Because the prayer isn't answered today. And so we think that God's not here answering us now. God is not here even now helping us through this situation. No, no, no. God is afar off. He'll answer it one day. Yes, he'll raise me from the dead and, and my back will stop hurting and my, my lungs will start working right and my eyes will start getting clearer. We think about that being long off, but we forget about the God that is working even now to fulfill those things. It's just that in the meantime, we're experiencing the all things. 
working together for good for us as we walk this road. But we have to have faith anyways in those dark times when things are uncertain. God does all of these things to the end that he would get glory, his love would be seen in us, and others would believe as a result of what he did for you. Verse 43, and back in John chapter 11, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. So they came to those that Jesus loved. And in a moment of their hurt and their despair, and how often do people come to you as someone that Jesus loved and they see you in hurt and despair and they may even say things like, could not Jesus help you from this pain? Could not Jesus help you from this health condition? Could not Jesus help you at this work thing? Could he not have done so and caused that he should not have died, but Christ knew better? He knew there needed to be a death before he could show his resurrection. He, needed there, he knew that there needed to be a death before God could be glorified to the fullness in this scenario. He knew that there needed to be a death before his love could be shown and shed abroad into those that were in this situation. He knew that there needed to be a death so that the others that came to mourn with the beloved one could see and believe. You know what also happened to the beloved ones? They saw and believed. And everyone in this scenario who had a heart ready to behold the glory of God and the love of Christ saw and believed and their heart was changed for the better. And we need to get to the point, Christians, where we realize that our sufferings have a greater purpose. Our sufferings have a greater purpose because God wants to use us in our sufferings to be glorified, to show his love, and to bring others to faith in Christ. So don't worry, don't doubt, don't fear. When you pray to God and he doesn't answer you right then and there, just hold on, trust him, and wait for his promise to be fulfilled as you walk this road of hills and valleys. Wait for his promise to be fulfilled in your life. And never, never, never think that this is a last days promise. No, 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 no. There's just a little gap as God works, even now. As he works even now.